She really, really means the world to me. She's frightening and comforting all at the same time. I don't know what I would do without her work. I'm so grateful to her. Got myself a piet. This is not mine. This is my friend Jen's. This is Jen's house. I don't know how Jen got a piet, but she got a piet. Come here. I want to talk about the genius of Sayaka Murata, but I haven't scripted anything. This is going to be me having a chat with myself, trying to figure out what it is about Sayaka Murata's writing that speaks to me so much. What makes her one of my favorite writers? What makes Convenience Store Woman my second favorite novel ever after Frankenstein? And what exactly is at the core of her philosophy, her ethos, her modus operandi? What is she trying to accomplish and achieve with her writing? I've said it in reviews and other videos and articles on Sayaka Murata, and I'm going to just Try and work through it all to come to a nice, neat conclusion. Sayaka Murata is my favourite Japanese author, tied with Miyako Kawakami, depending on the day I flip between the two. But Sayaka Murata is a very, very punk author. She's very angry. She writes very shocking and unsettling and frightening things. And everything she writes speaks to me in a way that I find almost uncomfortable. If you take a personality test, Quite often, the thing that kind of offends you and triggers you the most is the thing that best describes you. Because looking in the mirror can be really hard. And sometimes when I read the works of Sayaka Murata, I feel like I'm looking in the mirror. I feel like I'm looking at a truth about myself that I find uncomfortable to bear. Something that I very much know, something I can see in my habits and my behaviours and my thoughts and my opinions. But it remains difficult to see when it's staring back at me, especially in the form of another character. Now obviously not everything that she writes is relatable because she writes about sexual abuse, cannibalism, body horror, a lot of awful stuff. But it's all metaphorical. It's all expressionist. And I feel a lot of it. This might end up being quite a personal video because this is how I see Sayaka Murata's work. I was first introduced to Sayaka Murata with Convenience Store Woman, which is true for so many people. I was given a review copy in 2018, I was living in Korea at the time, and just about to move back to Tokyo. Convenience Store Woman is a novel about a woman who is 36, and she's been working at the same convenience store since she was 18. She has found a way to survive within the societal system. It's not a perfect way for her to live. She is comfortable. I don't think I'd use the word happy. But Keiko cannot survive on the ladder that her family insists that she should be climbing, that everybody should be climbing. A career path that has progression and a job that you can talk about and be proud of, followed by marriage and a mortgage and kids. She can't do any of that. She can't function in that role, and so she does what she can to survive. She has a job that she understands and she can do every day, and it avoids any anxiety, anything unknowable and confusing and frightening and overwhelming. She has found a way to just survive day to day in a familiar role and world that she understands. As she says, she is a cog in the convenience store machine and it works for her and it should be enough. I relate to her in the sense that I've never been able to be part of that, what Natsuki in Earthlings calls factory and what I often call the ladder, the ladder of life that most people are on. I have moved from country to country, job to job, I've never been able to stay put and do the same thing over and over. I am now self-employed and that gives me a lot of freedom. I am very different to Keiko, but I feel like we're coming at life from very similar angles and she speaks to me in a very deep way. She cannot survive in the typical formula of life and neither can I and so we are each doing things that allow us to survive. Keiko doesn't want a career. I have gone from career to career because I am very indecisive, and all the while I'm getting older and older, and have no idea what exactly I'm doing, but I know that right now I am content and happy and proud of myself. Keiko does not have children. I do not want children. There is a lot of overlap between me and her. Convenience Store Woman, at its core, is a novel about how you survive as a member of your society, if you cannot do the things that society expects of you. She is using cheat codes. She has found a way that works for her, even if other people think it's weird. It is still valid. The way that she's living and surviving and sometimes thriving day to day isn't normal. But there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing illegal or strange. It's just not what you'd expect. Keiko is also an incredibly clearly autistic-coded person. 
and I am also a neurodiverse person. I have ADHD. And so I hugely related to Keiko in that sense. There are moments where she just simply does not understand other people, and they do not understand her. And she misunderstands social cues or questions that are asked of her, things that should be easy for most neurotypical people to get on board with. And I think it betrays an autistic character, even though that is never expressly said to us. And therefore my interpretation of her as autistic might be wrong. I'm not autistic. But again, I bonded with her in that sense as a fellow neurodiverse person. Following on from Convenience Store Woman, the next thing I read was A Clean Marriage, a short story on Granta's website, also translated by Ginny Tapley Takimori, just like Convenience Store Woman was. In that, you have an asexual couple. I don't wholly agree with that. That's what the marketing use, that's what it says in the blurb if you read that book as part of life ceremony. I don't love the term asexual here. I have a lot of asexual friends, and I don't think that this couple is asexual, but that's the word that was used. There are a couple who are married, and they are very, very happy in their situation, but it is unique. It is a clean marriage. I'm doing this a lot. They don't have sex, but they can, if they want to, go get their jollies elsewhere. Their marriage remains clean and tidy and neat and organized, but then they want a kid, and they don't want to have sex to produce that child. And so they go to this clinic where there's this new experimental way of having a kid. It's not IVF. It's not regular sex, it's some other sci-fi-esque thing where the kid will be theirs, but they don't actually have to have sex with each other. And again, I related to this, because these characters, in a sense, are queer, and I am a queer reader, reading this, relating to it. As a queer person who doesn't view regular marriage and regular life in the way that a lot of people do, as someone who doesn't want to have children, there were things in this story to relate to, feelings and emotions and approaches to life that I understood. And Sayaka Murata is repeatedly relating this theme of not fitting in over and over again. Now, I am aware that as I talk about Sayaka Murata, it can feel like I am just some edgy teenager that thinks they exist outside of the mainstream. Yeah man, I'm punk, I'm different, I don't play your games, I don't play by your rules. There's no other way to talk about it though. There's no other way to relate yourself to these books, these stories. It's exactly what she's doing. She is being punk. She is looking outside of the conservative zeitgeist. There's no other way to do it. If you sound like an edgy teenager, so be it. And I'm sure a lot of edgy teenagers really like Earthlings. I'm sure that a lot of people who read Convenience Store Woman and enjoyed it read Earthlings and were pretty shocked and horrified. And others got on board with it and loved it. I'm one of those people. Earthlings is a terrifying book that includes horrible sexual abuse, incest, and cannibalism. It's not pleasant. It's very punk, it's full of body horror, it is uncomfortable. But once again, this is a book and a protagonist in Natsuki that I hugely related to. This book is a lot more on the nose, I think, when it comes to what Sayaka Murata is screaming and angry about. Natsuki believes that she is from another planet. She believes that the world is a factory that she is not a part of. She cannot fit into this factory. In Convenience Store Woman, Keiko finds a way to survive within society in the best way that she can. Natsuki, in Earthlings, refuses. She wants to leave the factory, push against the force field that wraps us all up, and break through it. And the only way that she can do that is by committing awful taboos. Incest and cannibalism. The two taboos that nobody ever goes near. These are two books that are doing something very similar. They are both about breaking away from societal expectations and norms. But one is about surviving within it, and the other is about breaking away from it. I absolutely adore the fact that she went this route with this book. The fact that she was willing to use body horror. Because I am a huge fan of body horror. I am a huge fan of schlocky 80s B-movies. I love frightening imagery. I live for disgusting stuff. And once again, edgy teenager. But I can't help it. 
I love body horror, I love grossness, I love blood and gore and guts, and you get a lot of that in here. But you also get a lot of trauma and sexual abuse and really horrible, uncomfortable things. It's amazing the different ways in which Sayaka is getting to that same point. How do you survive in a society that you are not fit for, that you are not built for? You use cheat codes or you break through the barrier. As someone who is non-binary and struggles a lot with gender dysphoria, I also kind of related to the body horror thing, and I've thought about this a lot recently, the idea that horror, body horror in particular, often feels inherently queer. There is something about taboo approaches to physicality and the body that feels very queer. Perhaps it's shame, perhaps it's the idea that throughout history, queer acts, gay sex, being trans, these things have been seen as wrong, taboo, defiance of God, doing things physically that you're not supposed to do. I wonder if that's part of it, there's some shame in that. But I also think that there's something very exciting and cool about it. The idea that you're messing with the status quo in a really fun way, even if it's just aesthetic, it makes us happy. And there's something that makes me feel connected to Sayaka Murata in that as well. The fact that she's using body horror makes me feel understood, and I wonder how deep that rabbit hole goes, but I like it nonetheless. The idea of change, physical change, biological change, aesthetic change, I find it all alluring and exciting, and it's all again present here. So repeatedly, the themes of queerness and neurodiversity in these stories are also really, really important to me. A lot of neurodiverse people cannot function in society. If you have autism or ADHD, you can struggle to behave in a way that you're expected to, like doing a nine to five job, working eight hours a day consistently and focusing on it, doing all of the social aspects that a job encourages you to do, like going to meetings, or just spending time around other people in the office. All of these things can be difficult and very, very torturous and traumatizing for people with autism and ADHD. And so again, neurodiversity is a very, very big part of this. These are incredibly queer and neurodiverse stories about not fitting in. And the simple fact of the matter is that if you are queer and or neurodiverse, you don't fit in. You don't fit into what your family expects of you. You do not fit into ordinary jobs and ordinary life. You can't follow strict timetables, be told what to do. You may not want to get married and have children. You may be polyamorous. You may be asexual. You may enjoy being alone. There are going to be so many things about you that don't work as part of the status quo. Ultimately, these are stories of fighting back against conservative, status quo society. And if you read Life Ceremony, you're getting more and more and more of that approached from slightly different angles. In many ways, when you read Life Ceremony, if you imagine this whole point, this, this, this perfect society that she hates so much as a sphere, the stories in Life Ceremony are poking at it from all different angles, from all different perspectives. And when you read Earthlings, it feels like a wrecking ball that just smashes through the whole thing. That's how I see it. Life ceremony is pinpricks poking at the walls of ordinary society, and then this thing just fucking smashes right through it. I love her stories because of the punk and unapologetic ways that she looks at society, looks at normality, looks at status quo, and says no thank you. As queer, neurodiverse, angry, punk, fed up people. So many of us relate to her stories because we feel what she feels and we live what she is exploring every single day. I understand Keiko. I understand Natsuki. I understand everybody in these stories to some degree or another, either because they're exploring neurodiversity, queerness, or just a sense of not fitting in. Sayaka Murata is a genius writer who understands my soul, and I think a lot of people's souls. I'm very grateful to her for expressing so many of the things that I have thought and felt every day of my life. I don't know what I'd do without her. I have more to say. I could talk about her for hours. I have talked about her for hours. Videos, articles, they're everywhere. I love the works of Sayaka Murata. She really, really means the world to me. She's frightening and comforting all at the same time. I don't know what I would do without her work. I'm so grateful to her.
I want to tell her thank you a hundred times. Subscribe for books.